chapter 19. Now these chapters that follow have a number of unusual things happening in them, but in other ages these things were not so unusual. They were sort of routine. These things sound f quite fantastic in the Book of Mormon. Those of you who heard Brother, Brother Packer during conference, he compared our time with what just, just 40 years ago. Well, I'd already been teaching 20 years, 40 years ago, but it's a different world, he says, remember? Compared with that world, our world today is just a pastiche of crimes and excesses. You wouldn't recognize it. Unfortunately, I don't think it's reversible either. It just goes more and more. And this is the Book of Mormon. That's where it comes in. It keeps, it keeps hitting back at us all the time. We thought that this, was, this was once thought to be utterly fantastic, out of the world, these, these excessive things, civilization destroying themselves, each other completely. Such a thing is utterly unheard of. Well, it isn't unheard of anymore, you see. The Book of Mormon is for our time. So the 19th chapter, we're talking about the, the, the passing out, there's these passings out. Well, they're routine too, and we're already talking about the Testament of Hezekiah, the lost Testament of Hezekiah, which is turned up, however, in the Testament of Isaiah, the a writing called the Ascension of Isaiah, where Isaiah goes to the king's court and uh, and he uh, he passes out on the king's bed, and the people say he's dead, and he's gone for two days, and he comes back again, and then the, he comes back and says. Uh, I have seen the Messiah, oh blessed Jesus, and so forth. It goes on the road. To, the very same thing that happens when the king comes to and when the queen comes to here, the whole family passes out. This passing out is quite common. Uh, the, uh, not quite common, but it does happen. A very famous writing uh, from, uh, well, it's 400 years older than Nehi, the journey of Wayne Ammon. The, the, uh, his whole journey, his whole fate depends when he gets to the, ca the, uh, the palace. Of, and this is a historical account. It's, a, it's an account of his journey uh, from Egypt. He's on business to, for the king. Uh, and he's a high priest. And he is in, in Tyre. And uh, Zakarbal is a Zakarbal, which means Baal, remember, he is the king there. And he would have lost everything if, uh, if one of the chief courtiers hadn't passed out and passed out in the same way, and then when he came to, he had had a vision, and it was his vision that released Wenneman, so that Wenneman was able to get away, and was, he was sent back again. He was able to go back again to Egypt. They were going to, he didn't get to Egypt. There were some pirates waiting out. So it was quite a story, anyway. But the point is that this passing out is, uh, is almost routine, as far as that goes, and then we find it. We're going to see the cases in which they find it. In religions, it's an important thing. It's so important, so basic as a religious experience that it's very commonly a faked and imitated. Once you've had it, you try to control it then. So what's about all this drugs, all this peyota? The dancing has that effect. Do I have this here? There's a, uh, yeah, to Chantepie. In the first volume of Chantepie de la Cezea, he did a great work on this subject. Betäubend, uh, nervpeitschend, ecstatische Zustand. The main point of religion was to be into a, betäubend uh, means bedizened. Uh, half out of your head and so forth, and nerve pitchings, your nerves all whipped up to the point of breaking, then going to an ecstatic condition. It's produced by dancing, by choral singing, by drugs, by incense, uh, dervishes, you know about whirling dervishes, they, they dance themselves into a drunken state where they pass out, and in the Indian sun dance the same way, and the mandans. You were supposed to exhaust yourself by dancing, then you passed out and had the visions, and then you came soon. Well, so passing out, whole groups of people passing out and coming back and reporting visions. You couldn't be a member of some of the Plains Indians unless you'd done that. A young man had to go up into a mountain uh, and fast and, and, then and, pr and pray until he became so weak that he passed out. And then he would have his private vision, receive his own totem, his own animal, and come back and report. And that would be attached to him, the animal, whether the bear or beaver, would be his, well, various customs in various uh, tribes. But you see, this business of passing out that seems so strange in these uh, chapters that follow, is this is the routine you're supposed to do this when you've had a real inspiration. Uh, and well, you, writers like Abraham of Santa Clara and the Tantra, you know what the Tantra is, the Tantrums, and as I say, the, the Shiva cult of, of Tantra and so forth. Uh, and revivalists, they pass out, and of course the Voodoo, they still do it, you see, in the, in the West Indies. In Haiti, they, they do, You've, you may have seen documentaries, movies where they get them, they get dance themselves into a fit and a woman will pass out, her eyes will go glazed, a woman or a man, voodoo, uh, this is part of it. So this passing out is quite a routine. It's faking the real thing, you see, if you can't have a vision, you can at least fake it as far as that goes, so people do this all the time. Well, we don't have to do that sort of thing. Revelation appears on various levels, and this is nowhere clearer than the Book of Mormon, where Lehi starts out saying, I have 
dreamed a dream, or in other words, I've had a vision. Well, at what level can you have it? A dream, a vision, they're all, they're all communication uh, beyond your control and so forth. So let's go on here and see the, uh, well, here's an example here. Start the 19th chapter. Amal was commanded, oh, he goes to the queen. Well, the queen passes out, you see, goes to the queen, and go in and see thy husband, my husband. <coughs> Some say he's not dead, but others say that he is dead. The same story of Hezekiah, you see, of Isaiah and uh, King Hezekiah and uh, the prophecy about Manasseh. So, well, cool. In the fifth verse, he says he's not dead, but others say he's dead. To me, he doesn't stink yet, so he's not dead. This was what Ammon desired, and uh, the light which did light up his mind was the light of the glory of God. Notice the imagery that's using, how often the word light is used four times in this one sentence. This did, well, the light which did light up his mind was the light of the glory of God, which is the marvelous light of his goodness. Yea, the light had infused such joy into his soul. No, there are six lights in this sentence. Light, 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 yes, yeah, six times. Infused, and a cloud of darkness. Notice this is imagery, and yet is it imagery? You're still... We're still based with a, faced with a basic subject, what is light, and nobody knows, of course. The photons don't have any weight, don't have any mass, they don't have any nothing. And, uh, but what are they? Infuse such joy in his soul, a cloud of darkness having been dispelled, and that light of everlasting life light up his soul, lit up his soul, there's another word, light, that he knew that this had overcome his natural frame and he was carried away in God. This is ecstasy. John is in ecstasy. The word ecstasy mean ec means out, and stasi means stepping out. So you step out of your body when you're in a state of ecstasy. And John, in Revelation, says that he was on the Lord's day in a state of ecstasy. He left his body. We're told the same about Abraham. We're told the same. The Hebrew is the Tardema of the Old Testament, the Tardema when you pass out. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, the same thing happens. Abraham passes out in the same way, and his soul is carried aloft, then he comes back and reports and so forth. Now, and this goes on. He is not dead, but sleepeth in God. In other words, God is taking care of him when he says he's sleeping in God. I have no witness save thy word, but I believe, he says. I, I say unto these women, and here's another one, you see. There has not been such great faith among all the people of the Nephites. Now, this isn't a paraphrase of the New Testament. After all, Adam, Ammon had been a missionary to more Nephites than anyone else. He knew the Nephites by heart. He says we don't find such faith on all the Nephites as we find here. And these people are... Uh, this is in the court of... Uh, what's her name? Uh, the Lamanite woman, yes. These are our Lamanites here. And this an interesting thing is about to happen here. And he arises and says, I have received my redeem. I have, I have seen my Redeemer. Well, in the, in the king comes to, and in the Isaiah text, when Isaiah himself comes to, on the king's, first the king passes out, then Isaiah. Isaiah comes to and he says, I have seen the Messiah. I have seen the Redeemer. See, he's been taken a lot. So we have a standard vision sort of here. And again, he sunk again with joy, and the queen sunk down. See, they're all passing out like this is the way you do when you're completely overwhelmed this way. He fell on his knees, gave thanksgiving to God, uh, did Ammon, you see, because he, he, his message has got over. He was so overpowered with joy, and thus he fell down too. He was overpowered with joy, and they all three had sunk to the earth. Of course, the hardest thing to contain is joy. Anybody can contain all sorts of pain. It's amazing what you can put up with when you have to put up with pain. Astonishing things. There's just no limit. Uh, and, but joy is a thing that scares the daylights out of you. You can't contain it. You don't know what to do with it. And uh, you know what's that? It makes us all... Uh, stradats, 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 the Moscow Art Theater. You know, suffer, suffer, suffer. That's the way you become an artist. Well, they love to suffer. The Russians, no limit to how, how much suffering they can suffer. But uh, joy... That's so much harder to take. You don't know what to do with it, do you? And yet, that's the purpose of our existence. We are that we might have joy. So we're learning to control joy and control ourselves when we have it. We can't contain it, you see. Uh, it's a hard thing to contain. What do you do? You, you shout, you holler, you run around, you make a fool of yourself and so forth. How can you contain that in yourself? Well, they're all sinking down here and passing out, and that's the best thing. After all, when pain becomes too great, you black out automatically, and so that takes care of that. The same thing with joy. You can't contain it. When you don't know how to handle a problem psychologically, what do you do? You black out. This is your defense. And this uh, it's a form of Pentecost here, uh, very special. In, I say in initiation. It's a, a part of initiation times. And uh, they are one-time experiences which people attempt to repeat, as I say, is in the Sioux Sun Dance and the Sufis. The Sufis are the most important branch of mystics among the Muslims. They have to pass out, you see. And uh, so you have your various dances and dervishes and things like that. 
And people wondered what was going on. They didn't understand. And they did call upon the name of the Lord. They had all fallen to earth. And then this Abish comes along, a very interesting name, because that's, that's a name on, on a, very famous, uh, a very famous Egyptian mural from a tomb uh, in the Old King, in, well, in the Middle Kingdom, in that fact, where the, the family comes, shows a family coming from Palestine to Egypt, so a family of Bedouins, very vividly portrayed, and, and the leader is Abish. And uh, it had fallen to earth, and this was Abish. She'd been converted to the Lord, never having made it known to anyone before. And she saw this opportunity. She ran forth from house to house, making it known. They began to assemble themselves. It's a great display here. And here they all lay as though they were dead. Now the people began to murmur among themselves, something's wrong here. Uh, they say, well, the king's brought this evil. Now this is the central theme, you notice, of this particular story. It's back to the waters of Sebus. The king has brought this evil on his house because he slew his servants who had their flocks scattered at the waters of Sebus. This king has done wrong in doing this, you see. Uh, and then those men, now this is the interesting thing that happens. What about the men at Sebus who had scattered the flocks? They were there. It says here, those men who had stood at the waters of Sebus and scattered the flocks which belonged to the king, they were angry with Ammon. They were, they were in the crowd. It was part of the game. They were accepted here. <coughs> A strange crime against the king, you see. Uh, and they announced their presence here. They shout out at him, uh, angry with Ammon because the number that had been slain at the waters of Sebus while defending the flocks of the king. And uh, one of them, they announced their presence. He was the brother of the one that Ammon had killed in the single combat, the only one killed with the sword, and he drew his sword and made it Ammon, and uh, he fell dead. Uh, so they did have swords after all. A strange goings on here. But it only occurs to them now that it had been wrong, what they'd, what they'd been doing there. Now the man had fallen dead, and the uh, fear came all the people, and they, they durst not put forth their hands, and uh, hectic goings on here, aren't they? Ammon, the Great Spirit, and others said he'd been sent by the Great Spirit. Here is the, the uh, Great Spirit. The, uh, well, I refer to an article of mine here. Uh, well, oh, it's in the World of the Prophets. But shamanism, this is very important. See, the basic, the basic priest throughout the ancient world is the shaman, as you know. And the shaman must pass out. He absolutely must, and he must nearly die, or he's not a true shaman, you see. And sometimes they really do. They don't come back. But they have to go back, and they have to be taken abroad. They have to be taken up to heaven by a bird, and they have to be brought back again after many trials. But they're all the way from the tip of Terra del Fuego, Fuego especially across northern Asia, uh, the shamans are, the f well, and as you find the pictures from Altamira in Spain and so forth of shamans in action in prehistoric drawings. Throughout the ancient world, the shaman was the central religious figure. But in order to gain his calling, he had to pass out, and he had to be taken to heaven in his mind, and it was a real experience. He had to fast uh, uh, until, he, until he was unconscious, and then he went through this experience. I say it not, unrarely, it not uncommonly happens that he doesn't come back again. So it's quite a risky thing, this, this shamanism. Uh, and it's very desirable, therefore artificially induced. Uh, they must have seen something to be real shamans and so forth. And they risk possession by evil spirits in the right. Notice some say that Ammon was sent by the Great Spirit. Others said that he was a monster. That it was the Great Spirit that had always attended the Nephites. It was this Great Spirit who had destroyed many of their brethren, the Lamanites. The Great Spirit is on the side of the Nephites. And it turned into hysteria. The contention began to be sharp among them. While they were thus contending, the woman servant came and told them about it and caused them. And then they said it was her fault. Uh, when she saw the contention that she had caused, she decided she was to blame and was exceedingly sorrowful even to tears. What have I done here? She went and took the queen by the hand and the queen rose then. Now, this is a, a critical situation, isn't it here? And uh, she clasped her hands with joy, speaking many words which were not understood. And when she had done, see, this is typical shaman comes out. He, he talks in, uh, in riddles and in rhymes. Like, well, again, you see, the ancient world was governed by the oracles. And what was the oracle? The oracle was a woman who was made to pass out. Usually she snuffed bay leaf. If you were very powerful, you know, if you live on, on, on the bay around the coast, if you go down to, to uh, Stinson Beach or Half Moon Bay and you get, the, you get the, uh, the laurel and you rub it like this and take a good sniff, you'll pass out if you sniff very hard. Well, the Delphic oracle, the woman who governed the ancient world for centuries, everyone went to Delphi to consult that oracle. She was a woman who sat on the tripod over a pot of, uh, of bay leaf, 
and uh, and passed out. And then when she was when she was out of her mind, then she would. Utter, it was uttered in rhyme, and sometimes it was uttered in in strange tongues, and sometimes it was in gibberish. And so we're in a type of institution which we're not familiar with today, but it has ruled the world until very recently. See, until very recently, we've had these things, uh, these uh, strange gifts and perversions, and so on. You'll find them among the Druzes in Lebanon. Very interesting. Yeah. For years, I went around with an old Druze, and uh, he taught me uh, various things about that, too. Uh, very strange things going on here. So she carries on like this. Then Lamoni, she took King Lamoni's hand, and he rose, and his people went forth, and he began to rebuke them for behaving the way they were. Uh, there were many among them who would not hear his words, therefore they went their way. Uh, if they believe not Moses and the prophets, they will believe not, though one rose from the dead, the Lord said. Uh, this was the... Uh, this was an anticlimax, as far as they were concerned. And Ammon arose and ministered to him, but you notice he didn't convince anyone. Many among them didn't believe it at all. And he went among all his servants, and uh, their hearts had been changed, and many did declare to the people that they had seen, seen angels. Uh, you notice angels must get things moving, because the point is this. Here we reach a critical point in Book of Mormon history. From this time on, the Lamanites start going up in virtue, and the Nephites start going down. The Lamanites become the virtuous people now. And it's very strong. It's a, a very strong trend we see from here on. You see, this critical moment uh, in history. It is the turning point. It had to be, and the only way such a thing could happen, you see, would have to be by another Pentecost, by an eruption of the Spirit, a breaking in, uh, an intrusion of the other world, so to speak. The, the, the theology theologians are talking a lot about this today. They never talked about it before, but they say what you have in the New Testament is an intrusion in the other, of the other world into this one, a breakthrough, <coughs> something that people <coughs> never could have arranged or suspected. A note of surprise, but the restoration of the gospel then is now. The main theme was surprise. Everybody was surprised as things were happening completely beyond their control and utterly ama utter amazement seizes them. The angels have to say, don't be afraid. Be a messenger for God and, from God and so forth. And so this is the, the thing. It's, it's, uh, it's not a normal occurrence. And so we get the, the big shift begins here in the Book of Mormon where the, the Lamanites begin to get a break. From now, we'll talk about mixing races. From now on, you're not going to be able to distinguish them at all. And many said they'd seen angels and conversed with them. And as many as did believe were baptized and became a righteous people, and they established the church. See, and thus the work of the Lord did commence among the Lamanites. That's why this thing is so, so sensational, so very striking. The work of the Lord begins among the Lamanites. And the moral of that, says, uh, <laughs> says the writer here, the Mormon, uh, is that his arm is extended to all people. And who's the shame is everything? Well, they have to move right on now, don't they? Well, the Moni desired that Ammon should go with him on a trip to see his father. The Moni said, well, won't you come and see my father? His father was the high king of the whole country, just like the Sachem uh, of the, the five nations, say, of the, uh, the eastern the Indians on the eastern coast when uh, the first pilgrims came here and so forth. They had a system of nations in which there was a, a high king and then the lower kings below them. And uh, no, but the Lord said, no, you won't go up to Nephi, but you must go to Midoni, which is the land of thy brethren. They're in jail there. Your brother Aaron, Mordecai, and Amma are in prison. The name Midoni is a very interesting name. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century we discovered the Mitanni. And who are the Mitanni? They're the nation just to the north and east of, of uh, Manasseh. There's Manasseh, half Manasseh in the desert east of the Jordan. Just to the north and east of them is the next nation, which is Madani, or Midian, or Mitanni. It's usually written Mitanni. It's amply uh, testified in the, in the Hittite, and especially in the Egyptian records. It's just the Mitanni. This is Madone, obviously, because it changes with D, oh, Mitanni. Incidentally, within the last... <coughs> one of our boys has gone to uh, Berkeley to study Egyptian. And they're telling him now that they have completely changed the sound of R, which used to be so dominant in Egyptian, has suddenly changed to L. You have to, they used to say there was no L in Egyptian. Well, within the last two years, you have to say L, where you used to say R. So this is the way we changed it. And the same with Matani, Madoni, you find these. But this is obviously Madoni he's talking about. They were the land next to, to Lehi country, half Manasseh there in the desert, east. Remember, Lehi was in Manasseh and Egyptian and all this sort of thing. And of course, Arabic, because we had the Ishmaelites here. They brought Ishmael along with them. The Ishmaelites keep their separate identify Ishmael. The Arabs, the, they still believe the Jews and uh, 
and the Arabs preached and Muslims that uh, Ishmael was the descendant of Abraham. He was the elder son of Abraham, and he became the father of the Arabs. And so when you pe have people going by the name of Ishmaelite, because there was this feud between Ishmael and, and, uh, and uh, Isaac, and they fight each other. So, and remember, the Ishmaelites had separated themselves here. They come along too. A complicated picture. Well, what goes on here? To the land of Madoni, and it was only discovered, I say, in the 1880s, and then they suddenly it was uh, Petrie decided it must be related to Midian of Moses and so forth. The brethren are in prison at Madonna, and the Moni, you will, I will go with you to the land, and the king says, well, I have some clout, I'll go with you and help you get them out with you. And so they got made ready his chariots and horses. Now, uh, as I was said before, with the exhausting treks of the brethren from land to land that we've been reading about in this part of the Book of Mormon, why didn't they ride horses? Like cowboys do, and Indians do, and so forth and so on. The horses appears in the Book of Mormon as a rare and exotic animal, exactly as the Arab steed appears uh, in ancient, medieval, and modern times. It was the, the Arab horse in Palestine. It was I went with uh, somebody in uh, 1964. His purpose, one of his purposes, was to buy Arab horses. They're very hard to get real Arabs, but you find them popping up. But they're only for kings. They're a royal, they're a royal animal. They're a rare. They say they aren't like other horses at all. The Prisibilic that comes from Central Asia and so forth. Uh, they're. Uh, special beasts. They're highly sensitive. They're too sensitive, as a matter of fact. They're nervous, but they're extremely intelligent, and there's something strange about them. There's something eerie about them. The Arabs will tell you at any rate. People say so. Well, if you, they raise lots of Arabs here in the, in the valley, but they're mixed uh, up toward uh, Pleasant Grove. So they're a rare, exotic, imported animal, and only for kings. Uh, maybe a, a great uh, duke might have one. Uh, because horses, the riding of horses, very limited, as you know, <coughs> throughout out the Middle Ages. Uh, anyone, uh, well, in England, by the, the Norman uh, laws, the forest laws of the Normans, no Saxon was allowed to ride a horse. No, only a noble could ride a horse. Well, what is the, what is the uh, common word for knight on the continent? It's ritter, a rider. Only a rider, only noble blood could ride a horse. And that's what the noble knights, of course, that's from the equestrian order of Rome. The equestrian order were only those of noble blood. They were equestrians. They could mount a horse. Nobody else was permitted to mount a horse. You had to have particular bloodlines. They were very special animals, usually limited just, just to kings until they became useful in war and so forth. But we find the same thing throughout Europe. You'll find where you never expect to find them, peacocks and elephants and camels. Uh, Fr Frederick II, king of Sicily, he, he had those. But they were rare and exotic things and always caused excitement. You would find them clear up in England sometimes. As I say, the idea of these strange beasts appearing and being taken care of, and this is a picture you get in the Book of Mormon. Only kings have them, and he's taking care of the king for his chariots. Nobody rides horses in the Book of Mormon. No, as we said before, nobody rides horses in the Near East, just as nobody rides bicycles and so forth. And uh, just as we don't ride water buffaloes here, we'd be scared enough to do it. They do it in the far, in the southeastern Asia. And he said to Ammon, I will go with thee to the land of Madonna. There he is, making ready the king's horses and chariots. That's a thing only for a noble person to do, you see. Because the question, the one who takes care of the king's stables, his, he's the constable, who is the constable of France. He's the one next to the king, you see. The constable, the one that takes care of the king's stables. And that's, that's as high as you can get. Remember the great constable, the great speech the constable of France gives in Henry V? Well, because he was the one that settled the peace between England and France and so forth. He was the, the king's highest representative and the like. So horses are a strange, exotic thing. You, you can't generalize about horses too much, as I'm doing here. But in the Book of Mormon, uh, I say they were imports from the plains, from the plains to the north. Because as my friend Woodrow Bora found out, all the, tr all the trade in horses between the continental United States and Mexico was not in the direction taking Spanish horses up to the continent. They didn't, know. They were bringing them down from the plains from through Santa Fe to Mexico. They were brought to Mexico, not from Mexico. He finds that significant, along with other things. We won't bother with horses too much. Well, on the way, now here's a very dramatic situation right out of Oedipus, isn't it? They met the father of Lamoni, who was king over all the land. He was the Sachem. He was the high king. And he gives a real speech. And this shows you that the Lamanites have a case. Uh, they really believe this, you see. The, uh, therefore, remember, this is the point at which the Lamanites turn, and they now start to become the righteous people. And they were justified in their own eyes in what they did, because here was the king, and he can't stand Nephites, because he says, they betrayed us, they tricked us, they've outsmarted us all the time. This was the point, because the Nephites did outsmart them. They would have a great resentment against that. 
Why did you not come to the feast on the day when I made a feast for my sons unto my people? Well, now the three year, the feast of the king is, is compulsory wherever you go. Uh, no one shall come to the last chapter of Zechariah, the same thing. From year to year, everyone shall come up to Jerusalem to the feast. See, it was the feast of the, the feast of the Passover, the feast of the booths, this was, the feast of the Sukkot, the Sukkot. They come to the feast, and you must come, and you must bring something with you. No one shall come empty-handed. You have to bring your, uh, your offerings of lamb or doves and so forth. You had to bring food with you, and they had the great feast. Well, it's like the coronation in uh, the coronation uh, in the book of Mosiah, uh, Benjamin, where Benjamin gave his great speech. That's a strict and correct description of the rite that took place at the feast, and it was feasting that they engaged in. And as I say, if you don't come, then you're an utlaka, you're an outlaw, you are outlawed from the kingdom for three years. You have no citizenship and no rights, but you must come and report. Have your name put in the Book of Life, the list of the Enkizi. I say you, I wrote a long, long article years ago. In fact, it was the uh, at Centennial Lecture at, up at the U when they were celebrating their, their big spiel, and it was on this, this very thing. But uh, this feast, it's uh, in the political court. They haven't reprinted it yet. It was a long one, way back in, in 51. Great guns, the Western Political Party for 51, long article on this sort of thing. Uh, why didn't you come to the feast? Well, then he said, also, whither thou are going with this Nephite, who was one of the children of a liar? Now, this is the case the Lamanites make out for themselves. Uh, this is a skillful history, too. It's like the telling of a saga, very much uh, the language is, too. This one who was the children of a liar, Lamoni rehearsed unto him where he was going, what he was going to do, because he had to tell him, told him the cause of his tearing in his own kingdom, why he didn't go to the feast, and so forth. And... Uh, now, when Lamoni had rehearsed him to all these things, he began to be astonished. Uh, to his astonishment, his father was not impressed, but he was furious. He said, Lamoni, thou art going to deliver these Nephites, who are the sons of a liar, to get them out of the, of the, uh, this is the Lamanite party line. Behold, he robbed our fathers, and now his children are also amongst us. That they, see, this, the, the, here we have these Lamanites. Uh, Nephites circulating and spreading missionary news, and Lamoni had given them a, a free hand. He'd given them a carte blanche to do anything they wanted. He goes too far. In fact, it causes a, re a revolution a little later on. So, but they robbed our father, and you're letting them do anything they want among us, infiltrate us, that they may by their cunning and their lyings deceive us, that again they may rob us of our property. See, we, we haven't been the robbers. They have been the robbers. See, this is uh, the thing. <laughs> The Nephites had consistently, like Alma and like Alma and Emma, had consistently outsmarted the, the Lamanites. And the Lamanites had a real grievance. Uh, they were not bad qual as Lamanites any more than the Russians are bad as the Russians. Uh, and this is an important insight into Lamanite mentality, why they thought to do it. We still treat the Indians this way. After all, they, they still get this small, uh, the, the dirty end of the stick, we'd say. And he, he ordered him to to slay Ammon with a sword. He wouldn't put up with it at all. He's very serious. He's as mad as a hatter. But Lamoni said unto him, I will not slay Ammon, neither he defies his father openly, and to defy the king openly is treason. Now when his 16th verse, and now when his father heard these words, he was angry with him, and he drew his sword that he might smite him to the earth. Because after all, he'd openly defied the high king, his father, and this was treason, and he should be smitten. But Ammon stood forth against him to his surprise, uh, and he says, if thou shouldst fall at this time in thine anger, thy soul should not be saved. No one dies well who dies in a battle. Remember this great speech of the soldier from Henry V where he says, uh, because we die in our anger, because we die in wrath, that's no way to die. It's a terrible thing, you see. And the same thing is, is here, you see. If you should die at this time in anger, thy soul should not be saved. And moreover, this innocent man, his blood should cry from the ground. What is the rationale of this saying, which we have again and again, get in the, in the Bill of Great Price especially, his blood shall cry from the ground, <laughs> from cry from the earth. There's a, 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 a rationale for this very ancient formula. Because the earth is the mother and of life and is the womb of the resurrection also. From the earth we are resurrected, you see, and out from the earth we are born. She is Mother Earth. The moon, she is the, the mother of life and the womb of the resurrection. And the destruction of life in any form is the reversal and perversion of existence itself, as we learn in Ether 8.19 in the Book of Mormon. God uh, will not the man should shed blood, but in all things has forbidden it since the beginning of man. It's an unspeakably horrendous calamity deliberately to reverse the process for which the earth was created. And the earth will not, if it accepts their blood, the earth will cry from the ground and demand, and demand a vengeance here, as it does in the, in the book of, uh, 
and Book of Moses. And I should shed innocent blood, for thou hast sought to destroy him, he says. But Ammon withstood his blows and also smote his arm. Good eye, hello, Ammon. He knew how to hit people's arms, didn't he? The 20th verse here. Now, when the king saw that Ammon could slay him, then it changed. It's with the guns in the other guy's hands now. Remember how quickly they change around in, the, in our endless police shows and so forth. Uh, the person who has the gun has all power, and at one moment he's insufferably arrogant, the next he's cringing. And this happens with the king here, <coughs> because Ammon has the gun now. He's holding it on him. Well, I'll give you anything, even half the kingdom. Again, why this old formula, half the kingdom? Uh, well, you know the game of chess. In English we call it chess, but that's just the first word, shock. It means the, the king. The, the game is shakmatch, as they call it in other languages everywhere, whether it's Russian, German, French, or anything. Shakmatch means the king is dead, and the whole thing in chess is to check make the king. Chakmach, checkmate means the king is dead. Mach is in all Semitic language means dead. Checkmate the king. And when he's checkmated, you may, may have every piece on the board, and he may only have two pieces on the board, but you win if the king is checkmated. He may, I say, he may have a whole board full of pieces, but he's beaten if he's checkmated. It doesn't make any difference how many kings, queens, and bishops he has. He's, uh, he has lost, and it's the same thing here, it's to beat the king. Well, if the king is lost, then he must lose all, you see. Then his kingdom and his whole army, another article I wrote, go over to the other side, and they belong to the other king, as far as that goes. But to save his life, he may compromise. He may not give away his kingdom, because he's been anointed and appointed to it, and it's a sacred office. He must keep it, but he must save his life, so we'll have to give you the kingdom. How does he do it? He splits it exactly in half, the having of the kingdom. He gives you half, he keeps half. He spares his life, he keeps his office, and he gives you uh, legitimate claim to your half. Well, this settles everything. But this is the idea of the half, you see, the king. How can the king possibly share it? Well, he can share it only if he has it. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of Egyptian law connected with this, of course, the halving of the kingdom and the red and the white kingdom and all this sort of thing. Uh, well, we go on. If thou wilt grant that my brethren may be cast out of prison, and so they spare him, and he saw that Ammon had no desire to destroy him. He was astonished by his behavior, suffer that my son Ammon should retain his kingdom. So that was all right. And I will govern him no more. He gives, he gives him a free hand, and I will also grant to thy brethren, that they may be cast out of prison. I shall greatly desire to see thee. Come and see me as soon as you can, he says then. And another minor king, notice, they went to the land of Midoni, and the king of Midoni was another one of those minor kings, and Lamoni was, was, was a fellow king, so they got along very nicely, it says. Lamoni found favor in the eyes of the king of the land, therefore he got the brethren out. If Lamoni hadn't got along, they never would have got out, but he, he, had, uh, he had influence, you see. But they were really in a terrible condition when they came out, you see, like the Ancta Sanctorum, because they had had a rough time, and then you see in chapter 21 it gives a flashback and showed how they happened to get into the prison and what they went through first. They separated themselves, going, and Aaron took his, and they went to Jerusalem, a city which the Lamanites called Jerusalem, after the native land of their fathers, which is of common practice, of course. And the Lamanites and the Amalekites and the people of Ammon built this great city of, of Jerusalem. See, there were three different elements in it, three different, uh, we can't call them races, but there are three different cultures joined together in it. And it tells us here, the Amalekites and Amulites, Amulonites, were still harder. They caused the Lamanites to harden there. Of the three, you see, the Lamanites were the nicest, but it was the Amalekites and the Amulonites. One was Nephite, and the other was, was, uh, <laughs> not Jaredite, and, and the other was um, Amulekite, of course. And it tells us that po apostates are the worst enemies of the church. They always are. See, they're much worse than any outsiders. They were still harder, therefore they, did, they caused the Lamanites to harden their hearts. And the Amalekites had built synagogues after the order of the Nehors. Good old Nehor church, you're going to find it everywhere. It was the popular church, it was the popular religion. And it was a religion, see. Most of these wicked people in the Book of Mormon are very religious, and they were here. And there rose an Amalekite, and they, they challenged him when they start preaching to them, remember, uh, to get them out of the prison. Uh, why don't the angels appear to us? Behold, we're, we're as good as you are. That's a good question, actually, you see, as far as that goes. Uh, and how do you know that we have cause to repent? Not such a good question. Everybody does. But we, for the first time, it was refreshing, wasn't it? Uh, um, President Benson's opening talk at the conference. It was the nearest to a talk on repentance I've heard for ages. You know, it was on pride. And whose pride? The wickedness of the Book of Mormon. And whose wickedness? Ours. That's what he was talking about. It was a call to repentance. That's what it was. He wasn't accusing other people at all when he 
gave that wonderful talk about pride. Uh, <clears throat> the Rosa and Amalekite, and why don't these, how do you know that we have cause to repent? Now, as soon as people say they are righteous people, of course you know they are not. That's, that's automatic, you see, your self-righteousness. Behold, we have built sanctuaries, we built churches, aren't we good people? We've done that. And we assemble ourselves, we go to meeting, and we believe that God will save all men. This is the routine. Uh, incidentally, it's an interesting thing. Repentance is missing from all your ancient religions except, except uh, the Old Testament. The Greeks, the word repentance doesn't exist for the Egyptians and the others. I've been reading a lot of Egyptian wisdom literature and the idea that you should repent. No, uh, what you want is luck. And uh, they never connect what you have done in the past with, uh, with your particular, your moral, moral misbehavior. You've done what you've done and then that's that, you see. But it's an interesting thing, there is no word in Egyptian for sin. But, uh, well, America today, Sin is having the wrong ideology. It's being on the wrong side. Uh, the Ten Commandments are only 50% binding. They bind us, but they don't bind us to our behavior. Toward, they don't control our behavior toward bad people. We shall not kill, we shall not lie, we shall not steal from good people. But you can do it with bad people all you want, of course, because they do that in the movies, they do it everywhere else. Uh, we have to call that revenge and so forth because they've been bad. Well, notice we're having this shift at this point. The good and bad are shifting between the Nephites and the Lamanites. We get it here. The Son of Man shall come to redeem mankind from... How do you know that? We do not believe in these foolish traditions. We don't need them at all, this, uh, this idea of the atonement. And now Aaron began to open the scriptures to them concerning the coming of Christ. Um, and the resurrection and the redemption. Knows this, is, this summarizes the main points of the gospel. Coming of the Christ, which brings about the resurrection, which brings about the redemption, the atonement, well, the redemption, and the sufferings of Christ, and the atonement of his blood. He gives them the whole, the whole package. And, uh, and this makes them madder than ever. He gives them the straight gospel. They were angry, they began to mock him. They wouldn't hear it. It sounded utterly ridiculous. So he just left them, that's all he could do, and went over to Ante, Ante, Ante. The people there were hard in their hearts, just as bad, so we left there, came over to the land of Madonna. The Lord says, if they don't receive you in one city, go to another. And came over to the land of Madonna, here's where, this is how they got to the land of Madonna, and this is where they were put into jail. See, that's, this has been telling us how they got in jail, it's been a flashback. Aaron and his brethren were cast into prisons, and the remainder of them fled. Those who were cast into prisons covered many things, and they were delivered by Lamoni and Ammon, so this is where we, we were in the story. And they went forth led by the Spirit after they were out of jail, preaching in every synagogue of the Amalekites, or in every assembly of the Lamanites, where they could be admitted, where they could be admitted. They brought many to a knowledge, and King Lamoni... Now, King Lamoni has a rather extreme program. He hasn't converted his people yet, but he really pushes the church. Uh, would you say he overdoes it? Because it's very soon going to, going to bring about a, revol uh, a revolution against him. They're going to get rid of him. The, uh, he had synagogues built in the land of Ishmael that his people could assemble themselves together, and he did teach them. And... <coughs> Any that fled from oppression by his king, the father, went to them. <coughs> and he declared that they might have the liberty of worshiping the Lord. And Ammon was thus teaching the people of Lamoni continually. And then he was led, Aaron was led to the land of Nephi, even to the house of the king, which was over all the land, which was in the land of Ishmael. Now these land of Ishmaelites, see, they were a different stock too. And he was the father of Lamoni. The king of the land of Ishmael was the father of Lamoni, so Lamoni was an Ishmaelite. And he bowed himself before the king and said, We are the brethren of Ammon. We will be thy servants. And the king was troubled in mind because of the generosity and greatness of the words of the brother of Ammon. And Aaron said to him, uh, he desired to know the cause, why, had not come, why hadn't Ammon come to, uh, to Madonai? And Aaron said he'd gone to the land of Ishmael. And uh, what is it? What is the spirit of the Lord? No, he asked him these questions about is there a God and so forth. Now, remember, we're trying to establish a bridge between the Lamanites who for hundreds of years had been going their own way and had their own version of the gospel. They kept the great spirit and they still have. They still believe all these things. And then it's a complex picture we have here. 
I know that the Amalekites say that there is a God, he says, and I've granted to them that they should build sanctuaries. This is the high king, you see. Behold, as surely as thou living, O king, says Aaron, there is a God, and he is the great spirit. Oh, well, the king asks him, is God the great spirit? So an Indian says, we believe in the great spirit. Do you believe in the great spirit? It's a legitimate title. And Aaron said to him, yes, he is the great spirit. He created all things. So we both worship the same great spirit after all. And Aaron saw that the king would believe his words. He began from the creation of Adam. There's a starting point, you see, an ongoing history then through uh, verse 18 here, the creation of Adam, the plan of redemption. And since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. Now, how could that happen? What does that mean, you see? Since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself once you had fallen. Why had he disqualified yourself once you fall? If you just fall once, why do you disqualify yourself? because you will never again be as pure and as strong as you were before you fell just that once, unless you undergo a complete renovation again. So we have to have the, uh, the atonement and baptism and all that, you see. But it's true, you see, once you've yielded once, you'll never be as, as strong and as uh, certain as you were before. You may think, well, uh, I found out now I had to learn about sin, but it doesn't work that way, you see. Nevertheless, we do have to learn about it, so here we go. But there is... See, that's the gospel. It brings this very powerful medicine in after we've got ourselves good and sick here. And uh, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, uh, being a king uh, is a very interesting thing. I've been reading accounts of Nectanabus, of Alexander, of a brand new, just discovered papyrus of Sesebek, a king. And they're all about the same thing. They're called the Vandier papyrus. And there are others. And it's the story of the king who has one great worry. Alexander the Great ruled the world, as you know. And the story that we read in the Pseudo uh, He had, had just one obsession. Everywhere he went, every oracle he visited, every land he conquered had just one purpose. He says, Why do I have to have such a short life? He says, Why do I have to give it up? Can't I last longer? How long will I live? And in this story of Sesebic, the king is told that he can only live seven days. Oh boy, that really gets things going uh, when Mariri. Uh, the wise scribe is the only one that can prolong his days. And uh, there's a terrific thing where the wise men all fail and so forth. It's, it's quite a papyrus. It's, it's already come in for some, just in the last year, for some very important commentaries and so forth. But the point is that these kings, the great kings, they say Sebek, uh, whether it's Harun al-Rashid or whoever it is, uh, they're supposed to have everything, you say. But what's good of having everything if you can't keep it, if you can only keep it for a very little while? And this worries kings more than it worries other people's. Uh, to, uh, to be thus, remember, he says, is nothing. What does, what does he say here? Yes. Yes, if I can only be king for a little while, it's nothing. I'd sooner have... I'm, I'll think of the quotation in a minute. Let's not slow down for it, though. Uh, say, what shall I do that may have eternal life? And, uh, yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, the guilty king, you see. The king can do anything he wants, so he's done some pretty awful things, you can believe that, you see. That I may not be cast off at the last day. Behold, I will forsake my kingdom that I might receive this great joy. And at the end of the pseudo Callisthenes, Alexander, as you know, he, he, he climbs a, uh, a Himalayan peak that nobody had climbed before. It pressed Alexander to do that using pitons. He got up. And then he consulted with the Brahmins, with the wise sages of India. And this was his one question, you see. And uh, they treat He says he'd receive, he'd give up his kingdom or anything else if, he might, if they might would, would assure him of, of eternal joy. Uh, and they say, well, you're the king. You can do what you want. He says, no, I, that's one thing I can't do. You see, this is, what, what can you promise me? Well, they can't promise him anything. Uh, so, and so the king is desperate here. And he starts out like St. Augustine begins the confessions. O God, if there is a God, and if thou art God, make thyself known. Is this a fair prayer to ask, O God, if there is a God? How can you pray to him if you're not sure? And if you pray to him, you're assuming that he exists. Aren't you cheating that way? You ask him to reveal himself. Uh, and this puzzles St. Augustine. He says, I, I pray to God to reveal himself, but in praying to him, I, I've assumed he's already revealed himself. That's not right. I'm supposed to be completely rational, completely logical here. I can't cheat by assuming that God exists before I prove that he exists. You see, and how can I do it? It gets all tied up in that. And uh, Fides Quirane's intellectum, he calls faith, looking for an intellectual justification for it. Uh, that I may be raised from the dead. See, that's what he wants. He wants to be raised from the dead. Look, his kingdom doesn't count for anything, I say, if it's just going to go down the drain. Well, so many stories. The story of Hisham, the 
great story of Hisham on that occasion, the, the king whose uh, end draws near. It's a tragic story. It's the very essence of tragedy, isn't it? The king who has it all, uh, well, the little prince, uh, uh, the story of uh, uh, who's this? And it came to pass that his servants ran and told the queen. He was struck as if, he, here it happens again. See, he struck as if he was dead. Here we go again. This is just a short one. It has a scurry in the family. The queen is angry. The servants don't lay their hands on Aaron and his brethren because, uh, and when the queen sees that the servants are scared stiff, she begins to be frightened. Uh, and she calls the people in that they can slay Aaron and his brethren. And Aaron saw that things were getting bad, so he put forth his hand and raised the king. A much shorter episode than the other one, you see. The whole household were converted to the Lord. Now there was a multitude gathered, and they, because of the great murmuring, the king stood forth among them. It parallels the other occurrence before, uh, other missionary occurrence. It follows a, uh, a formula almost here. The king sent a proclamation, and then, now we have here, oh boy, I have to move along. On uh, the 28th verse, a nice summary of Lamanite culture. Remember, we, the Lamanites are changing their ways now, and this is the way they had been accustomed for centuries now. The more idle part of the Lamanites lived in the wilderness and dwelt in tents, teepees or what you will. And they were spread throughout the wilderness on the west. They're always on the west here, on the west of Zarahemla, all along the west side, land of Nephi, along the Pacific coast there, uh, the, yes, the Pacific coast west, in the place of their father's first inheritance, because they landed from the Pacific, thus the land bordering along the seashore, all island right, the Pacific coast. And they could complain about Nephite aggression because the Nephites had practically bottled them up here. There were many Lamanites on the east by the seashore where the, ne the Nephites had driven them to the east shore. They wouldn't allow the east and the west to make contact. As, as the, gen the general stop says, the one thing to avoid is a war on two fronts. So they kept them separated. They kept, the, they kept the Lamanites off balance because they were greatly outnumbered by the Lamanites. And you could see why the Lamanites would resent that, being always kept off balance, always stirred things up and so forth. It was called desolation, being in the far north. You get up in the desert country in the far north. I suppose it's Sonora, something like that, uh, the desert up there. The far, uh, so far northward into the land which had been peopled and destroyed. There had been other people in the land, and not too far away. See. These weren't the first people. When you find bones, it doesn't mean you're Nephi, Lamanite, or Jaredite, necessarily. I think that the Jaredites were much farther up this time. And they came from there uh, up into the south, and they came from there up into the south wilderness. From north there, they came up. It's just like the Nile, you go upriver when you go upstream, and the, of course the South Wilderness. Mexico is much higher elevation than the, than the coastlands, believe me. And they called the land was desolation, the land northward, and the land southward was bountiful. Now we're told in the Milhama scroll, the, the battle scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, before the battle, the priest would go out before the Lord of Hosts and formally dedicate all the land of the enemy as horma, as desolation. And then he would dedicate all the land of Israel as blessed, as the land bountiful, as blessed of the Lord and fruitful. So there were the two lands, and they were supposed to expand the land. See, it's like expanding uh, into the Dar al Harb and the Dar al Salam, see, in, in Islam. Dar al Islam, all the peacefied land, Dar al Harb, and Harb is the same thing as Harma, see, it means desolation. War, desolation, destruction. So everything that hasn't been conquered by Islam is Dar al-Harb. That's the desolate part. And the other is Dar al-Islam, the, the land that was just submitted to God. And it's the same thing with the Romans, of course, the Agar Pacatus and the Agar Hosticus, the pacified land and the hostile land. Anything you haven't conquered is refusing you submission and therefore is in a state of rebellion and must be conquered. So the Romans had to conquer the world. They didn't feel safe. They always felt sa unsafe if there were enemies on their border. By enemies, they mean any unconquered people, because they misused everybody, and so they expected people wouldn't like them too much. And so we get this crazy imperialism that goes on. Well, they have a case sort of against the, the Lamanites here, the Nephites, don't they? Desolation and bountiful. And uh, oh, and, and of course, in, uh, well, it goes on. With a day and a half journey on the line bountiful and the land desolation. Uh, we're told that the king of Arad, we're told in Deuteronomy, that the king of Arad tried to conquer some of the Israelite tribes and they counterattacked and laid it waste. And I should have brought, uh, well, Numbers 21, 1 and 3, it tells us that they dedicated all the land was called desolation after because it was destroyed and they wouldn't allow anything to grow on it again. So they called the kingdom of Arad the, des the land desolation as against the, the land of Israel. So desolation and the Nephite, the land of Zarahemla, nearly surrounded by water. That certainly places us in the central 
in Central America, doesn't it? The Nephites were hemmed in, notice the Nephites had hemmed in the Lamanites on the south. They wouldn't like that, you see. Now the wisdom of the Nephites was that a country they might have as a reserve place up in the north where they might flee. See, they were outnumbered and they looked forward to a time when they might have to withdraw, something to fall back on, so they kept the land up in the north. And they had this, this was their, their policy, this was their military policy through the years. And you could see it would always bring pressure on the Lamanites. The Lamanites were always making their slave raids and so forth. Well, wow, the time is up now. And this is just what you might call historical stuff and so forth. But the Book of Mormon simply shines through this thing. I mean, it's so much like the stuff I've been reading now that uh, it's, it's just right in the same library. And people never recognize this because they don't read the other stuff. But this, uh, well, we certainly should be uh, finish. Wow. We should, and certainly should finish out with this semester. 56 chapters, is it 52 or 50? Right, 57 chapters? 62? 62 chapters to Alma. We're now in chapter 23 and we've been four or five weeks on it. We're really gonna to have to speed things up.